Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Julian Costini from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Dr. Costini is an orthoplastic surgeon based out of Buenos Aires in Argentina. After completing his orthopedic residency at the University of Buenos Aires, Julian pursued an adult reconstruction fellowship at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, United States. He currently works at the Italian hospital in Buenos Aires. He has several publications in high impact journals and is a reviewer for the Journal of Orthoplasty. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Julian Constantini from Buenos Aires. Over to you, Julian. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation, Dr. Uh, hope you guys all enjoy. So what we're going to talk about today is about revision knee, arthroplasty. We'll go through kind of a step-by-step -step system and how I perform my revisions knee nowadays. So it's important to know that the projections done for primary hip and primary knee in the United States will be that we will have an increase of over 600% for primary knees. With that being said, uh, we will have a lot of revision as well going on because of these different reasons. When we go and we look after why total knee fails nowadays, we still see that infection is the, the most common cause of, uh, of failure, but aseptic loosening as well as instability, periprosthetic fracture and pain are still uh, in a high percentage of cases with that why a knee fails. So we need to be aware of those causes and how to treat and address those things. So how and when I do indicate a, a revision here. So first the physical and the, the visit to the pain of the patient to the clinic uh, with his, uh, their chief complaint. Then we go through the physical exam. We go some x-rays, uh, labs when needed. Sometimes we order CT scans and we get to see a lot of uh, uh, new information as well uh, inside the operating room uh, when we are making our final decisions and thoughts over what problems will, do we find. So when we go through the physical exam, instability is a, it's a common cause to, to see, uh, not as often and not as unstable as this look, knee might look uh, in, the, in the clinic but we get to see a lot of instability, especially in flexion. So as we see here, this patient is globally instable, but there's a lot of patients with pest pain and, and, and grossly instability, especially going downstairs. And, and we need to go through and look after those uh, flexion instability and mid flexion instability. When we go through x-rays, we always take a AP lateral view, sunrise, and we always take in all our patients long leg views. Uh, what uh, we look on those x-rays, we look for signs of loosening, as we see here. We see, uh, we look for maltracking problems with patella. We look forward uh, to see any kind of uh, alteration or deviation from the mechanical axis. Uh, and sometimes when we are still on, on doubt on what's going on, we might still order stress views and virus vagus and AP inflection stress uh, as well to, to look off after ligament instability. So another thing about important about the x-rays is to compare. So whenever we get the chance to, to look over all the x-rays and even if the patient was not operated by us on the primary time, uh, we try to get those x-rays and compare. As we see here, we see the initial post-op patient, and then we see five years after how that tibial uh, base plate has sunk into the into the tibia, uh, and the uh, same in the lateral view, we see some bone loss over the anterior cortex, some bone loss over the posterior cortex and posterior condyle, and, and then we start to kind of uh, create our plan and see, and imagine what we're going to find on the, on the operating room. Another good thing about x-rays, it's about this criteria, criteria from the knee society. Uh, and we set scores for each zone of the knee, uh, either on the AP over the tibia and, and the lateral knee, uh, on, the, on the lateral view over the femur and the tibia as well. Uh, and we sum all these numbers and we have 
uh, a high value for aseptic loosening, uh, a high value for uh, a doubt about uh, how loose can be the, that knee, uh, or the, if there's no signs of loosening on the x rays. Labs. So we always ask labs for our patients, even if they were not operated by, if they were operated by us, where we look at the CBC to see the, the uh, blood white uh, uh, cells count. We see the set rate, we see the CRP, we look after glucose and the uh, hemoglobin, the glycate hemoglobin of our patients to, uh, to see if there's any signs or suspicious of infection and to see as well how we're going to deal with some medical issues of our patients that might be at risk or greater at risk for surgery as diabetic patients. CT scan is not very often that we order, but whenever we don't see any gross uh, signs of loosening on the x-rays, patient has a kind of a, a weird um, medical history and, and patient is with a, with a funny knee, uh, X, uh, CT scan is a good exam to look after uh, rotational problems. As we see here, uh, this patient with a, a good tibial rotation, but we see that the patient has over six degrees of internal rotation. So that might be a big problem for this patient and, and probably the reason why his knee is not working so well. So taking a CT scan, whenever we don't see uh, a big problem, patients with uh, poor mobility, a lot of fibrosis in the knee, getting a CT scan might be helpful. And then we start with our reconstruction plan. Uh, what does that mean? So we look after our approach, we look how to preserve bone stock, we look how to restore our flexion, extension, balance, and gaps. Uh, we look for our alignment, uh, either coronal or sagittal, uh, to choose optimal ligament stability, define the constriction needed for those, needed for those uh, ligaments uh, as, as they work well or not and then choose an adequate bone implant uh, interface reconstruction, how we're gonna fix our revision knee. So it's not very often luckily that we see these uh, big tissue scars with a lot of previous surgeries, but these patients, we are always uh, concerned about having wound problems and then patients that might have uh, to, to have a, a flap, a muscle flap or some sort of special team for microsurgeries, uh, microsurgeons who, who perform those uh, special closures for us. Uh, and it's important to, to be aware. Uh, rather than that, we always try to go through most external uh, of the scars so we don't compromise uh, vascularization of the skin that much. When we go to the, to the approach, it's really important to well follow the previous scar whenever the patient has only one scar. We dissect the planes, as we see, go all the way down to the fascia, so we don't compromise the irrigation of the of the skin and the and the fat tissue. We do the the arthrotomy, uh, as shown on the video, uh, and it's really important. We always go with the uh, medial palpatal tendon approach, uh, and it's really important to to clear not only the middle side uh, of the tibial. We, with the bovi or an osteotome as, as shown here, but it's, it's really important to clear, to clear all the fibrous tissue from the lateral gutter, from the back of the, the, the patellar tendon on the, that scar tissue on the, on, the, on the fat pad. So clear all that fibrosis is a great part of the, and it's a very important part of the approach. Another thing that we always do as a routine is to take out the poly. So just taking out the poly that loses the knee a lot and that helps a lot uh, getting all tissues around, getting the patella to the lateral gutter uh, without doing a lot of stress on the, on, the, on the extensor mechanism. Sometimes we need to get standard approaches as we see this patient here with, uh, with the patella baja. Uh, and those, that's the case when the rare case where I might be uh, indicated tibial tubercle osteotomy, a TTO, just to get the, the tibial component out, to get a good exposure without compromising the patellar tendon. And even I can address the, uh, the, the short uh, patellar tendon doing a, a partial lengthening. 
uh, mostly whenever we have some fibrous tissue, a lot of fibrous tissue and a hard exposure, I go for a, an extended approach with a, uh, over the, the, the quad tendon. Uh, so doing a snip, it's a, it's a great option to, to get all the tissues uh, wide open and get a good access to the knee joint. When we talk about bone stock, Besides the loosening and the bone loss done or that occurred with a with failure of the knee, getting the implants out might, might do a lot of damage to the bone. So getting the, the femur out, this is how we get the femur now a day is out. We took a, a reciprocating saw and we go just in the interface uh, between the cement and the bone and clear, clearing all the, the areas of the bone and being extremely careful not to, to get inside the, the bone and the knee. And this is what we look for and to get the, the knee with the minimal bone loss. If we don't, if we're not able to, to get the, the cement out of the prosthesis, at least this get the, the prosthesis with all the cement into the bone and then we can proceed and, and clean the rest of the cement out of the bone. When you go to the tibia, and it's just a primary tibia, it's really important to clear all the back side of the knee, all the, the lateral and, and back part of the, of the tibia as well. And there's a lot of scar tissue on that point of the knee. So we clear that. What I personally like to, how I personally like to remove the tibial component, I take a, a 2.5 drill bit uh, as it's shown here. And then I got a statement pin with a, just a, a universal hand drive. And then I, I just knocked it down from, knocked it up from, from the bottom. And this is how I can get to get all the, the tibial component with a minimal bone loss, with minimal damage to the, to the surface of the, of the tibial plateau, especially because this area is a very poor quality of bone when we take the, the tibial component out. Whenever we have a, a steam uh, tibial component, so what we do is to use uh, special instruments where we we get to assemble and get all the the tibia component fixed to the extractor, and then how we extract the tibia with minimal bone loss and, and without damage to the to the metaphysis and to the diaphysis diaphysis of the of the tibia, and then we start to look what it's damage left. So the bone loss is because of the implant removal, is because of the septic loosening, it's because of the implant uh, malalignment where it was put it on, osteolysis from uh, debris from the poly uh, or post-traumatic as well. Uh, sometimes we get to see a lot of bone loss. And there are a lot of classifications for academic purposes, the most uh, used for our service is the AORI classification, the Anderson Orthopedic Research Institute, where they classify in three degrees of the bone loss. But at the end of the day, what I personally do is to classify uh, defects and contain or uncontained defects. So that's what makes the big difference about how I'm going to choose the reconstruction plan, what implants I'm going to be using, and how I'm going to fix those implants uh, on those patients. And then we start to surgery. So a nice way to, to start surgery is to have these uh, three-step plans uh, created by Kelly Vines, where the, the first step is to establish a perpendicular tibial platform on the second step, we fix and, and we try to look after the, the femur size and establish a, a good flexion and gap size. And as a final step three, we go ahead and then we finish with the flexion gap doing uh, unstable and getting an unstable knee, either flexion or extension. It's really important when we take the femur out uh, is not to undersize the, the revision size uh, the, the, of the femur. So because of the bone loss, uh, we get to, to see a lot of patients that come with a, maybe a revision 
and it's grossly lose inflection because we the surgeon is unaware of the bone loss of the, the posterior condyle. So, uh, and even if the surgeon is is aware of it and, and, and decides to go with the smaller femoral size, we might have to go up with the, with the joint line and then we start to get issues with patella and knee flexion instability. So it's really important not to undersize the, the femur on the revision setting. So as a part of the, the step one, as I, as I mentioned for, uh, for, uh, before, it's really important to get a, a nice tibial surface perpendicular to the joint line. And, and then for revision, we always use intramedular guides. So as it shows in the pictures, we set the, the cutting guide according to the, the implant that we're using. If it has zero degrees, three degrees or seven degrees of tibial slope. So we gotta be really careful on the rotation of those uh, marks and guides to for, for make a, a perfect cut. This is once done the, the tibial cut and just sizing the tibia. And then here with the tibial tribe, just in the correct rotation with uh, the supplement that we need to just restore the, the joint line. When we go to the step through two and three, so as I mentioned before, it's really important to size the femur and not to undersize the femur. Then we go with, uh, with the reconstruction of the, of the femur. Uh, and then we go, as I mentioned, first of all, looking for the flexion gap. And you see, we see how stable is our flexion gap in here. And with the, all the augments that we had to use, uh, either on the tibia and the posterior condyle. See, then we go through all the range of motion, going to stress and virus and vagus. Sometimes I even test that stress with a primary poly, not with a constraint poly, just to get a real notion about my balance. And then we go to the flexion gap, to the extension gap, and, and try to get, and we should, and we must have the same flexion gap as the extension gap with the, the implant that we are trialing. Otherwise, we have to go back and start over measuring our flexion and extension gap and see where is the, the failure and, and where are we failing to get the unstable knee. Once we get all the, the reconstruction done, we gotta choose the, the constriction. What type of constriction are we gonna use in, in our knee revision? Are we going with the primary poly as here in the left? Are we going with a constrained virus? Are we going to need uh, a rotating hinge implant? Uh, on what I make my, my choose or my options nowadays? Uh, it's mostly be why then it failed. This is the most important thing well, from where I start. It's just a, a primary that fails because uh, some loosening because of uh, uh, an implant that has a poor track history and, and, and early failures. And I know that my ligaments are okay. Maybe a CR that became a little bit more loose or uh, inflection or, uh, or with an aseptic loosening, I might choose a primary poly. I don't have any, I don't hesitate a little bit at all uh, with uh, going through a constrained condyle uh, poly, they, they have um, uh, improved a lot over the last year. So there's, uh, there's not that much stress over the, the, the post and the, and the implants and even with the new fixation methods that we're gonna talk about a little bit la uh, later, uh, it's, uh, it's a great option. And whenever I got to uh, do a, a hinge is because I have no medial collateral ligaments. I have a gross uh, posterior capsule deficiency uh, with a, a huge mismatch between the flexion gap and the extension gap. Sometimes we get patients with multiple revisions with a, 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 a huge a giant uh, flexion gap. And we are not able to, to compensate that with the implant and making an even flexion extension gap. And then we go to the fixation, the final part, but most of the, probably the most important part to, to have a, a great uh, success in our revision setting. And this is a great way to, to plan a fixation. So this is a paper done by Fars Haddad in, in, in England. Uh, and we have three zones basically in the knee. We have zone one, 
which is the, the joint surface. We have the zone two, that is the, the metaphysis. And then we have the zone three, the diaphysis. In order to get a, a successful fixation, we need to get at least two zones fixation and well fixed implants on those two zones for uh, preventing from uh, early failure. In the case of a revision, usually the joint line, the joint surface and the zone one is a poor uh, zone with a poor bone quality. And even if we have some bone, but because most of the times we, we don't have a lot of bone to, to get an implant over there. So the, the focus nowadays, it's done on the, on the metaphysis and the, and the diaphysis of the tibial canal and the femur canal. So the metaphysis is probably nowadays the, the principal cause of aseptic loosening. So we see that we have some uh, sclerotic bones, we have poor bone quality, where we are not gonna be able to, to get a good cement interdigitation and, and, and that uh, tibial base platform. So we, we got to improve our fixation over the metaphysis uh, to, in order to, to prevent failure. So, uh, and, and this is a good paper in, in bio, in bio in basic science paper that talk about biomechanical differences and stress over the tibial component uh, comparing a CCK with a rotating hinge. And we see that uh, with different kinds of activities like uh, walking or doing squats, uh, and they got to measure the stress over the tibia uh, with, uh, with the CCK and a, and a rotating hinge. And the CCK implant, as shown on the, on the graphs, there's a lot of stress and micro motion over the metaphysis of the implant. So it's really important to, uh, to get a good metaphysial fixation uh, on the revision setting when we are using a CCK implant. And we, if we see the graphs, both graphs on the hinge implants, we see that the hinge implant has a lot more stress all over the construction. So not only the diaphysis is important for the, for the hinge, the whole diaphysis is really important as well to, to get a good fixation and, and preventing from, from early failure. So, and this is a clear example uh, of a lady that I operated myself She's a, she was 81 by the time of the, of the revision surgery with this uh, loose tibial component. Uh, I thought maybe she's 81. I thought she had a, a good metaphysis and a, and a joint line that, that was acceptable for a cemented component. Uh, and then we see her four years later with a, a loose tibial component with pain and needing for, for surgery again at 85 years old. So uh, the, the metaphysis is probably nowadays, for me, the most important point of fixation on the revision setting. How do we uh, get a better metaphysis for fixation? We, we can still use bone. The bone is available all over the world. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of experience with bone grafts. We can add vancomycin to the bone graft that will not compromise the fixation and the interdigitation and incorporation of the bone. Uh, and it helped us a lot, as it's shown here in the picture, with the small cavitary defects, in, especially in the young patient. So, uh, bone from the bone bank, it's still, uh, the bone graft, it's still a good option uh, in, in a lot of cases. So, but there are some limitations, especially when we have a, a large defect, as I was talking about, this is a paper out from Mayo Clinic where they got 17 knees over five years follow-up uh, with uh, structural allografts and they got a 20% failure mechanic and uh, mechanical failure on, on those reconstructions. So uh, in maybe in, in big defects, not contained defects, going with allografts is not the best option. And, and as I said, uh, small contained defects as this paper all from Dr. Masri, and uh, there are no different with the allografts, femoral head allografts uh, and mm, trabecular metal cones at five years. Uh, we don't, know how or what is going to happen maybe later 10 15 years if the bone graft will kind of uh, uh, 
get loose, uh, get some absorption, and then become a, a loose uh, implant. But uh, at least for small defects and contained defects at five years, there is no difference. And then we have the, the, the advantages nowadays of the trabecular metal, either the tantalum or the trabecular titanium, uh, with more than 15, almost 20 years of experience around the world. Uh, and it's probably a, a great uh, gadget that, that came to the revision because uh, as, as we shown earlier, is where the, the, the knee tends to, to fail on the revision setting, especially with the stress of the condylar constraint, the CCK implants or a hinge implant. So getting a, a good metaphysis with a, nothing that will get reabsorption is a, it's a great option. So here are the patient that we took the, the tibial component out because of uh, infection and instability with a uh, extensive mechanism dis disruption. And then we see how we, we get a good tibial base plate platform where we can put our tibial implant and make the, the whole reconstruction in place without major concerns. This is another case where we see a patient with a, with a revision, with a failure and loosening because of a poor metaphysio and we see the, the huge defect on the, on the femoral metaphysis uh, and then how we can uh, supplement that uh, and fill that defect with, uh, with this uh, kind of a titanium uh, 3D uh, made uh, cones for, for the femur. So it's a good option and it has uh, great advantages as we were able to use shorter stems uh, without going through the canal with, uh, with cement and that cement that can deliver uh, antibiotics and help with uh, preventing or either treating infections when we're doing one state revision. So it, it's really a, a good option to, to go through uh, uh, with a cemented stem. Even for big defects here, we got different types of cones. So, and we get to, to establish a, a good table platform for, uh, for an implant. And when we get to see the, the femur with big defects as well, the same thing. So this is a patient with a huge defect, good epicondyle. So we, we, we don't have the, the ligaments compromised, but all the inner side of the femur where we get all the, uh, the fixation of the implant and probably the, if we're not, Kind of a fix that we will have a loose early loosening of those implants. So here is the final construction and with a with a stable CCK knee. What is the, the another advantage or maybe a disadvantage of an uncemented stem? Sometimes we get issues and we got problems like this lady with a with an allograft of the of the tibia or an allosteosis but with the loose of the prosthesis, instable, without extensor mechanism, but we have this well and extremely fixed femoral component. And sometimes like this case, it's extremely, extremely uh, difficult to take those components out. As we see here, we had a, a dissemble from the femoral component and we, had, we ended up doing a, a femoral osteotomy to being able to, to get that femoral stem out of the canal. But so we, we go through a, a big, big surgery just to, to get the implants out and then start our reconstruction. So that's our, our major advantage nowadays about going with short cemented stems with metaphysical fixation. So it's my, my choice nowadays and how I fix it. Well, how about the results on, on metaphysical fixation? So this is one of the first papers that came out from the Mayo Clinic on tantalum cones. So 160 cones, two to 10 years follow-up, 23 fails. Um, six of them paying attention because of a, of a rotating hinge. So again, how a, a hinge implant put more stress on the, on the reconstruction and how important it is to get not only the metaphysis, but the diaphysis with a good fixation on a, on a hinge implant. And with uh, the 3D titanium cones, we have some uh, data coming out in the literature, like this paper uh, from the Cleveland Clinic with uh, 142 revisions, uh, defects 2B, 3B, from Anderson uh, Big Institute classification, media uh, follow-up 
four uh, years with 98% of survival, just five con being revised, three for infection, one for fracture, and only one for aseptic loosening. So we have uh, good data coming out and, and helping us with uh, conf confirming our, our choice uh, of how to, to fix the, these implants. So as a conclusion, planification is mandatory and uh, how are we gonna identify bone defects and, and look after instability causes, follow always the three-step approach. So always start from the tibia and then we go up with the construction to the femur. Choose an adequate constriction. So don't hesitate if we have to, to go with the CCK implant uh, and even more if we have to choose a, C, a, a hinge implant. So whenever I get suspicious, I go with both implants to the room and I choose inside whenever the patient needs. And then be aware of the zone two fixation. So this is probably the place where most of our revisions are failing because of a poor fixation on the, on the metaphysis. So it's important to get a good metaphysical fixation on our revisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gopalan. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Julian, for that brilliant work and uh, amazing presentation. And congratulations for the excellent uh, cases that you're doing at uh, Buenos Aires. Couple of questions from our side. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, the metaphysis is one of the most important reasons uh, where you can get a good result after a revision TKR, right? So. What are the options in the metaphysis? Either you can go with a cement bone graft or some form of uh, augments. So what yeah, is the yeah. best uh, option? So uh, it will probably depend on the size of defect. Probably cement, I, I, it won't be on, my, on, on one of my choosing options. I, I, I wouldn't use cement at all. So probably, uh, every once in a while we get tempted about okay i'll put some cement and it's it's a small defect and putting cement or and we have that experience from the knee from the hip as well so putting cement on a sclerotic bone is not a good idea so we will never get fixation of that cement so never choose cement for defects uh, so or we use bone graft either bone graft or metal augments uh, and and that's grossly depends on where are we working? So there are some places where uh, cones are not available, uh, but we do have a lot of graft. So if it's a, a small contain a defect, uh, we can use morselized bone graft, uh, impacted bone graft. If, uh, if it's a bigger in the defect, we, we can do a, a femoral head allograft, structural, structural grafts. So, uh, and, and nowadays with technology advancing as it, it has advanced in the last few years, we have a, a lot of places being able to, to do 3D printed cones uh, as we want. So we, we don't only need the, the big industry uh, portfolio, we, we can have local places doing those cones as well. So uh, today at my place of work, where I get all of those options, uh, my first choice is to go with a metal augment for the metaphysis. Thank you, Julian, for that. And also your center is one of the places where a bone bank was available. I mean, one of, in those uh, earlier days, right? Maybe 20, 30 years ago. And what has been your experience in using bone graft for these patients? Have you used them? And do you have any comparisons at all? And is it a frozen, uh, fresh frozen graft that you use? Well, we don't use fresh frozen. We, we use frozen graft from, from the bone bank. And, and most of the, the graft that we use uh, come from femoral heads for, from primary hips. So for, for more slice and, and impacted bone graft. Uh, it, it's kind of a, a, a philosophical uh, discussion that we have because we were created, we, we raised up in a, we were raising in a, in a in a place where biology was all that matters and restoring bone stock and, and being the more biological possible reconstruction uh, done. Uh, but, but nowadays, uh, getting bone graft for us is not as easy as it used to be in the past. 
we still have some concerns about disease transmission with bone graft. So it's really rare. And here at the bone bank, at bone tissues bank, uh, they, they take a lot of, uh, of concerns and, and they take a lot of care with uh, getting all the exams, PCRs for HIV, all things needed to prevent those. But uh, the risk, it's still there. Uh, and by the end of the day, I think that the thing that worries me more is that uh, the fact that the bone graft, especially on big defects, uh, defects 2B and 3, uh, it can be uh, reabsorbed. So reabsorption of those grafts is the thing that most concerns me. Thank you, Julian, for that. Just one last question before we wind up the session. Uh, now, when we talk about exposure in a revision total knee, right, there are a lot of issues like... Uh, reflecting the quadriceps, etc. So what is the approach when you have any difficult exposure? Is it quadriceps snip or uh, do you uh, employ tibial tibial osteotomy? Yeah, so whenever I had a patient with a lot of fibrosis, it depends on the patella, basically. If I if I have a, an extremely patella baja, uh, I, I go and I perform a tibial tubercle osteotomy uh, but it's not my first choice of, of, of difficult approaches or the extended approaches to the knee. I'd rather do and work over soft tissue than bone for the exposure. So my first option for an extended is, is doing a quad snip. Uh, and then I, I can kind of reflect all the, the lateral part of the quad tendon uh, without problem. And it's really important whenever we do the, the quad snip, is, as and I show on the video, is to clear all the, the gutters uh, because if we, if, we, if we do not do that, uh, there's no quad snip that we will be able to, to turn down the, the patella. So it, it, that's probably the most important part of the, of the approach to clear the gutters. Thank you, Julian. Uh, Julian, I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for the fantastic lecture. And I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much for joining. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation.